Um, good evening. On behalf of the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, I'd like to welcome you to this public hearing regarding the proposed rule to list the Miami tiger beetle under the Endangered Species Act. We are glad that you're here with us tonight. My name is Cecilia Towns, and I am the solicitor for the Department of the Interior in our Atlanta, Georgia office. I will be pre the presiding official for this hearing. My role is to conduct this hearing in order that we receive your comments accurately into the record. I am not involved in the decision-making process regarding this rule um, tonight. Please um, make sure you've taken your seats and mute your cell phones. Take the time to spot your nearest exits. They are to your left, right, and in the rear. The restrooms are located outside the doors to my right and your left. Once you exit the doors, the restrooms will be found on your left and on your right. My obligation to the Fish and Wildlife Service and to you, the public, is fourfold. First, to maintain order. Second, to maintain a friendly and non-hostile environment. Third, to keep speakers to the allotted time limits. And fourth, to ensure that each of you have a fair and equal opportunity to be heard. At this time, I would like to recognize Ms. Sonia Thompson. She is the Environmental Resources Project Supervisor for Miami-Dade County. Thank you, and with us, we also have the following representatives from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, Ms. Roxana Heinzman, she is the Field Supervisor for the Fish and Wildlife Service at its Florida, South Florida Ecological Services office in Vero Beach. We also have Ms. Dana Hartley, who is the Supervisory Fish and Wildlife Biologist at the South Florida Ecological Services office, also in Vero Beach, Florida. We have Emily Bauer, who is an eco, eco Ecologist, excuse me, at the South Florida Ecological Services Office in Vero Beach, Florida. We have um, Mr. Ken Warren, who is the Public Affairs Officer um, at the same Vero Beach office. <laughs> and finally, um, we have Ms. Victoria Davis, who is a biologist in the Services Regional Listing Section in um, their Atlanta, Georgia office. Additionally, we have staff from the Services South Florida Ecological Services Office um, in Vero Beach, Kristen Barth, David Bender, Mark Blacknell, Andrew Karen, Paula Halupa, Nadine Oyola, and Mark Salvato. We'd like to, you want to clap? Um, we'd also like to thank the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Office of Law Enforcement, our Federal Protective Service, and the Miami-Dade College Department of Public Safety for um, providing their services to keep us safe tonight. Also assisting with our hearing is a court reporter, not Kellyanne, no. <laughs> Matthew Haas, and he's with iRealTime Reporting Incorporated. Um, he will be recording our proceedings and provide us with a transcript at a later time. We also have Sandy Pasquale and Elizabeth Bonnet from Interpreters, um, and they're providing sign language interpretation. Um, so before we get started, I wanna give um, a short list of ground rules and then we'll have some short statements and a presentation by the service, and then we'll follow the majority of our hearing, which will center around the public comments that you provide with us with today. So for the ground rules, during this hearing, you will be able to provide us with your written or oral comments. In order to present oral comments, you need to sign in so that we can allot as much time as possible for each speaker. You will find the sign-in sheet just outside the double doors to your left, to my right. If you don't wish to speak, then you can provide written comment by filling out a comment card, which is also located outside at the sign-in tables. Comment cards are to be placed in the box located at one of the sign-in tables. 
When you register, please indicate any organization that you may be representing um, tonight. When you're called on to present your comments, please come forward to the chairs near the microphone in this front row here. We will call you to the microphone one at a time. Please then begin by stating your full name and spelling it for our recorder. Also, please indicate what um, organization you represent, if any. If you're reading your comments, please take care to read them slowly enough for our court reporter to understand. Also, if possible, we would appreciate a copy of the comments that you read. Please deposit them in the comment box located just outside the double doors. During the hearing, you will not be questioned in connection with your comments. Your comments or questions are being recorded by the reporter to preserve them for the record. Based on, on our agenda, we have allotted about an hour and a half to receive oral comments, and that gives us about five minutes for each speaker. While individuals may speak on behalf of their organizations, you will not be allowed to yield your time to other speakers. We will be using an automatic timer and timekeeper. Um, we have an automatic timer on my right, and that activates the green, yellow, and red lights here, right there, on a small device. It will be green during the first three or four minutes of speaking, or three minutes, and at the two, hmm? Four, okay, first four minutes. Um, at the four minute mark, the, the light will flash yellow for the last 60 seconds, and that will let you know that it's time to wrap up. And then at the end of your allotted time, the red light will flash and you'll hear some beeps. This public hearing is designed to afford you the opportunity to voice your comments and for the Fish and Wildlife Service staff to gain information from you as uh, regarding your view of the proposed federal listing of the Miami tiger beetle. You can ask a question, but the question will not be answered during the public hearing. It will be recorded by the court reporter and considered in our development of the final rule. This is to ensure that everyone has a chance to comment. Comments must be made directly into the microphone facing the front of the room. Please keep in mind that the reporter will not record any statements from the audience or any statements which are made to the audience. We ask that you treat each speaker with respect and refrain from making comments from the audience whether you agree or not with their statements. Out of respect for presenters, we ask that you please refrain from photographing individuals as they present their comments. We ask that you not applaud or make loud noises. Loud noises or side conversations may prevent our reporter from making a proper transcript. Please be civil, courteous, courteous and respectful. These ground rules are necessary to guarantee that everyone has a fair and equal opportunity to be heard, and we will enforce these ground rules. Instead of presenting oral comments here today, or in addition to oral comments, you may submit comments in writing. As noted earlier, <clears throat> written comments may be submitted by filling out a comment card and then dropping it in the comment box outside the double doors to your left. If you brought written comments, you may also deposit them in the box. Staff at the registration table can help you find comment cards and the comment box. Additionally, comments may be submitted at any time during the comment period electronically or by hard copy. Information on how to submit comments is available at any of the tables. Written comments will be given the same consideration as oral comments. At this point, I'd like to reintroduce Ms. Roxana Heinzman. She's the field supervisor for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in Vero Beach, and she will provide us with a brief statement about the proposed listing for the service. Good evening. I thought I printed this out big enough to not have to have my glasses, but I'm getting old, so pardon me for the spectacles and, and the reading. On behalf of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, I would like to extend our deep appreciation for your time, your attendance, and participation tonight. We know everybody's busy, and we appreciate you coming out to participate in your public process. The service truly values your views, perspectives, insights, your data, and any information that you might share with us. Your input is an important part of our rulemaking process, and it will help shape our decisions and our final determination. I want to thank the Ken Miami Dade College Kendall campus 
for graciously allowing us to hold the public meeting in this really beautiful facility tonight. Specifically, I'd like to thank the president of the Kendall campus, Dr. Beverly Moore Garcia and her team. Thanks to Robin Starks, the chief of public safety for the college and her staff. I'd also like to recognize the director of the Earth, Earth let's say this fast three times, Earth Ethics Institute, Colleen Ahern Hedick and her, her staff. Especially Nativa Kolitz, they participated with our team to help coordinate the many details associated with this event, including arranging for student volunteers that present, are participant, participating tonight. Um, they are Ali Orcio, Kritzia Ibarra, and Maria Para, and I appreciate. I apologize if I messed up your name there. Um, I also want to just take a moment to thank the law enforcement officers who are keeping us safe this evening. The Ecological Services Division of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service works to protect and restore healthy populations of fish and wildlife and the environments on which they depend. To accomplish this, the South Florida Ecological Services Field Office has several programs. We have Everglades Restoration, Planning and Resource Conservation, the Coastal and the Partners for Fish and Wildlife programs, and our Endangered Species Listing and Recovery Program. This process tonight is part of that program. Our office is one of three ecological services field offices in Florida. We're located in Vero Beach, and we provide service to 19 counties in South Florida. This is a public hearing under Section 4 of the Endangered Species Act. It is specifically for the proposed listing of the Miami tiger beetle as endangered. You can see them up there. Notices that this public hearing was published with the proposal to list the Miami tiger beetle as endangered in the Federal Register on December 22, 2015. Notification of the public hearing was also made through news releases, legal notices, and on our website. As Cecilia said, we will accept comments and information on this proposal until February 22, 2016, either received by or postmarked by that date. After review and consideration of your comments and all other information gathered during the comment period, the service will make a final determination. All comments received tonight and all others received during the comment process, either in writing or electronically, and all peer review comments will be uploaded to regulations.gov at a docket that number that is very long to read and is on all the comment cards if you'd like to get it. The purpose of this hearing is designed as a venue for us to receive your comments about our proposed listing for the Miami tiger beetle as endangered. While we also present some information for you tonight, we're mainly here to listen to you. Let me also state that we are aware of the intense interest that surrounds proposed developments in the Pine Rocklands habitat where the Miami tiger beetle lives. So before we dive into the, specific, the specifics of the listing proposal, I want to update you on the status of those proposed projects. We are aware currently of two proposed developments in the Richmond Pine Rocklands. There may be others that we're not aware of. The first is Miami Wilds at Zoo Miami, and the other is Coral Reef Commons located in north central area of the Richmond Pine Rocklands. We are working closely with the prospective developers and key stakeholders in Miami-Dade County to consider the beetle in the development plans for these projects should they move forward. To date, we have not received any formal plans or proposals from the representatives of Miami Wilds. For the Coral Reef Commons project, our office is currently reviewing a draft habitat conservation plan and incidental take permit application. The applicant chose voluntarily to include the Miami tiger beetle as a covered species in the application, even though it is not yet federally listed. We have been working with applicants to in efforts to avoid and minimize impacts to the beetle and other listed and imperiled species found in the Richmond Pine Rocklands. Should either of these projects move forward, the public will have an opportunity to comment through the National Environmental Policy Act process before the service makes any final determination on permit issuance. Comments on proposed development will be solicited in a separate process from the one tonight. As we have done with this hearing, opportunities to comment will be noticed in the Federal Register, in local media, and on our website. 
Please be aware that we will not address comments on the proposed development received at this hearing tonight unless they are specifically related to the listing proposal for the Miami Tiger Beetle. Remember that the focus of tonight's public hearing is to take comments and information on the proposed listing of the Miami Tiger Beetle as endangered. Comments on all aspects of this proposed listing are very important and we will carefully consider each of them. Because of the importance of your comments, it is necessary that we adhere to the procedures and ground rules that Cecilia provided. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Emily Bauer, an ecologist on our staff, who's going to give you a short PowerPoint presentation and overview of the Miami tiger beetle, its habitat and threats, and why we have proposed it as endangered. Thank you, Roxana, and thanks to everyone else for coming out tonight to provide your comments and for your interest about this proposed rule. The Miami tiger beetle is one of the smallest tiger beetles in the United States at a quarter to a third of an inch in length. This tiger beetle is uniquely identified by its shiny dark green dorsal surface and the small white markings at the back end of the abdomen. Tiger beetles in general are active predators using their well-developed jaws consume prey, especially ants. Tiger beetle larvae are elongate sit and wait predators that live in burrows in the ground, as shown in this picture. Hooks on the body anchor the larva into the burrow while the upper part of the body can extend up to capture prey. Larvae can stay in the ground for up to a year or more. When they become adults, they leave the burrow. At that point, they can fly and look for a mate. The adult flight season for the Miami tiger beetle runs from May through October and they have a lifespan averaging no more than one year. The Miami tiger beetle is only known from open sandy areas of Pine Rockland habitat on the Miami Rock Ridge within urbanized areas of Miami-Dade County outside of the boundaries of Everglades National Park, which is west of the area depicted on this map. This figure roughly shows the Miami Rock Ridge in beige, which runs from North Miami south to Everglades National Park. The species was first documented in 1934 from North Miami in the vicinity of Berry College. For over 70 years, this beetle was not seen and was thought to be extinct by most scientists. Then in 2007, the Miami tiger beetle was rediscovered in the Richmond Pine Rocklands, the largest contiguous piece of Pine Rockland habitat in urbanized Miami-Dade. Upon its rediscovery, the Miami tiger beetle was classified as a species based on its unique morphological characteristics, seasonality of the flight season, geographic distribution, and habitat. By morphological features, I mean the size, shape, and structure of an organism. Some of these features are displayed in these photographs. These, sorry. These images visibly show the differences in the patterning of the hardened wing covers in the Miami tiger beetle, which is on the far right, as compared to the other closely related species in Florida. The seasonality, or the length and timing, of the adult flight season is also unique. It's five months for the Miami tiger beetle versus two to three months for most other tiger beetles. The geographic distribution is also distinct and is not known to overlap with the other closely related species in the state. The Miami tiger beetle is only known to occupy Pine Rockland habitat versus the scrub or open sand habitat of other beetles. Based on surveys to date, the Miami tiger beetle is extremely rare with only two known populations. One population occurs within the Richmond Pine Rocklands and the second is within five miles of this and separated by urban development. Surveys for adult Miami tiger beetles have found few individuals in each population, ranging anywhere from none to a maximum of 42 beetles in any one survey. Based on the beetle's restricted range, two isolated populations with few individuals, and threats that I'll discuss shortly, the viability or the ability of the species to persist through time is uncertain. The Fish and Wildlife Service has been concerned with the status of the Miami tiger beetle since it was rediscovered in 2007. Since that time, we reached out to partners, gathered information on the species, 
and funded four surveys. Back in 2013, we began assessing the status and threats to the Miami tiger beetle and considering the need to add the beetle to the list of endangered and threatened wildlife. Then in December of 2014, we were petitioned to emergency list the Miami tiger beetle and designate critical habitat. This petition was received from the Center for Biological Diversity and others. In 2015, the, serv the service responded to this petition and determined that while emergency listing was not warranted because the threat of development was not imminent, we would evaluate the petition under the standard listing process. The proposed listing that we're discussing here this evening is the result of that process. So before I talk about a listing determination, let me just go over some definitions that are used in the Endangered Species Act to shorten some of the legal definitions on the slide. Extinct is a species that's no longer living. Endangered is a species that is in immediate danger of becoming extinct and needs protection to survive. And threatened is a species that's likely to become endangered if it is not protected. So to determine if a species needs to be listed, the service uses the best available scientific and commercial information available including, but not limited to, peer-reviewed literature, meaning literature that is reviewed by subject experts, survey data, petitions, and any rebuttals to petitions. All available data is then used in consideration of five major risk factors. They are the present or threatened destruction or modification of a species habitat or range, overutilization of the species for commercial, recreational, scientific or educational purposes, disease or predation, <clears throat> inadequacy of existing regulations, and other natural or man-made factors that affect the continued existence of the species. So under factor A, the present or threatened destruction of habitat, Pine Rockland habitat is globally imperiled. This figure shows the historical and current distribution of Pine Rockland habitat in Miami-Dade. Within this area, there's been a loss of 98% of Pine Rockland habitat. And as you can see, the remaining 2% is highly fragmented. Fire is a vital component in maintaining vegetation within Pine Rockland habitat. It's also critical in providing the open areas that are necessary for the beetle. Unfortunately, because most of the remaining Pine Rockland habitat is located in urban areas, it's difficult to use prescribed fire and it's not burned as frequently as needed to maintain suitable habitat. After many years of no burning, vegetation begins to invade into the sandy open areas that are needed by the beetle. Remaining habitat is also at risk of additional losses from proposed development projects within the Richmond Pine Rocklands and any other suitable or potentially suitable sites. As mentioned earlier by Roxana, we're aware of two proposed projects Coral Reef Commons, and Miami Wilds, but there may be others that we're not aware of at this time. The service is currently reviewing a draft habitat conservation plan for Coral Reef Commons, and although the Miami tiger beetle wasn't proposed when the draft habitat conservation plan was submitted, it was included as a covered species. To date, we've not received any formal plans from representatives at Miami Wilds. So based on the best available data, we identified loss of habitat as a major threat to the Miami tiger beetle. We also identified collection as a significant threat to the beetle. Tiger beetles in general are highly collectible. The risk of collection of the Miami tiger beetle is high as some sites are generally accessible and are not routinely monitored or patrolled. Considering its rarity, this species would be highly sought after by collectors. This slide hopefully gives you an idea of the intensity of tiger beetle collecting and trade. The photo on the left here shows some of the approximately 1,300 tiger beetles that were trying to be smuggled out of Australia by two collectors. And the web page on the right shows an ad for the sale of the Highlands tiger beetle, a species that's fairly rare but more common and closely related to the Miami tiger beetle. The price on this ad is in euros. So as you can see, this is an international issue. Due to the few remaining populations, low abundance, and restricted range, collection could have negative effects on the reproductive and genetic viability of the species and contribute to its extinction. 
It was because of this threat that we did not disclose the location of the second population in the proposed listing. When evaluating the adequacy of existing regulatory mechanisms under Factor D, we consider relevant federal, state, and local laws and regulations that may minimize the threat to the species. Prior to this proposed listing, the Miami tiger beetle had no specific federal protective status. Although the Miami tiger beetle occurs in some of the same habitat as other federally listed species, which may provide some protection for the beetle, those protections are not enough to adequately protect the beetle. As we mentioned earlier, the Miami tiger beetle only has two small populations in a very small geographic area. That makes it more vulnerable to negative impacts than other species that occur in the same general habitat type, but that have larger populations or broader geographic ranges. In addition, actions that support the biological needs of one species may not be sufficient to protect the Miami tiger beetle. For example, protective measures that help conserve butterflies, host plants, might not be adequate for conserving tiger beetle burrows. Therefore, while these other listed species may be able to tolerate impacts from a project, that very same project could be more harmful to the beetle, depending on the location and the nature of the project. Additionally, the species has no state protective status, and to our knowledge, it's not known to occur on state lands. With regards to local protections, county programs and regulations provide limited conservation to environmentally sensitive lands. For example, the natural forested communities provide some protection for habitat. Still, county code does allow for some pine rockland to be developed, which may be insufficient for conservation of the species. Overall, despite existing regulatory mechanisms, these are collectively not enough to sufficiently reduce the threats to the beetle and its habitat. The Miami tiger beetle is vulnerable to extinction from its severely reduced range, the two known remaining small populations, and the species' relative isolation. This species is not known to disperse great distances, and the two populations are likely isolated from each other. Given the status of the species, any catastrophic events, such as extreme weather events or great variability in survival and reproduction, could have huge impacts on the population and greatly increase the chance for extinction. <coughs> Pesticides, such as from mosquito control or agricultural spraying, are a potential threat for the Miami tiger beetle. Currently, Miami-Dade mosquito control's implementation of spray buffers for butterfly critical habitat has greatly reduced this threat. Climate change and sea level rise are also a threat. All of the projected scenarios from small-scale climate shifts to major changes indicate negative effects on pine rockland habitat throughout Miami-Dade County. This includes everything from rising temperatures, increased storm frequency and severity, changes in rainfall patterns, rising sea levels, and coastal squeeze, which occurs when habitat is pressed between rising sea levels and coastal development. Even before projected inundation of pine rocklands, they're likely to undergo transitions, including increased salinity in the water table and soils, which would ca cause vegetation shifts, potentially impacting the beetle. So based on the severity and the immediacy of all of these individual risk factors that were identified and are probably acting in combination, the service concluded that the Miami tiger beetle is in danger of extinction throughout its entire range. Therefore, we proposed to list it as an endangered species. Threatened status was not appropriate because of the severity of habitat loss and degradation and the few remaining known small populations and other threats as discussed. Also of note is that we've combined the 90-day and 12-month findings with this one proposed listing rule. These findings are part of our petition process and combining them was an efficiency that saved staff time and costs we had enough information in our files from the petition and from documents received after the petition to determine that listing is warranted and to proceed with the proposed listing as an endangered species. The listing process also requires a determination of critical habitat. Critical habitat is defined as the specific geographic areas occupied by the species at the time of listing that contain the physical or biological features 
that are essential to the species' conservation and may require special management considerations or protection, as well as the specific areas outside the occupied areas that are essential for the conservation of the species. So in addition to proposing listing as endangered, we determined that critical habitat for the species was prudent but not determinable at this time. In determining critical habitat, we not only consider the biological factors, but we also consider the economic impacts of the critical habitat designation. We have initiated the process of gathering this economic information, and we anticipate proposing a critical habitat rule later in 2016. So how does listing actually help the species? Well, first and foremost, it brings greater recognition to the species and its status. It requires the service to implement a recovery plan for the species, and this can allow for increased conservation through funding and partnerships. Listing requires federal protections, including evaluation of federal agency actions to ensure that activities funded or authorized would not jeopardize the species. It also requires designation of critical habitat if prudent and determinable, and directs federal agencies to use their legal authorities to carry out conservation programs for the species. Listing protects the beetle from take, as defined here, or even attempting to engage in these activities. Listing does allow for permitted take of the species, either for scientific purposes or if it's incidental to carrying out an otherwise lawful activity. This is only a proposed rule. It's not final. With any proposed rule, there's an open comment period before the rule will become final. There's currently an open 60-day comment period for the proposed listing of the Miami tiger beetle that will close on February 22nd. As part of this open comment period, we're seeking information on the Miami tiger beetle's biology, habitat, and threats. There are multiple ways that you can comment. We're holding this public hearing here tonight for you to provide your written or oral comments. You may also provide comments online at regulations.gov or through the mail to that address. A handout on how to comment, including these addresses, is located in any of the tables tonight. This proposed rule will also be peer-reviewed by seven tiger beetle experts. All the comments received will be considered as we develop the final rule, which will be different from the proposed rule. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for attending and for your interest in the Miami tiger beetle. As stated earlier, questions will not be answered here tonight, but will be recorded for consideration and development of a final rule. I'll now turn it back over to Ms. Towns. Thank you. Um, so at this point, we're ready for our first speakers to begin. If you have signed up to provide a comment, we ask that you move to the front um, in, in these front rows so that you're close to the microphone. Um, uh, our first speaker will be Mr. B.J. Chizar. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, Mr. Chizar, please come to the microphone, state your name, and spell it for the record, and identify who you're representing tonight. Following Mr. Chizar, um, we'll have Ms. Carmen Ferrero. Um, after Ms. Ferrero speaks, then uh, we'll start giving the, the next people in line. Right. Good evening, B.J. Chizar, B. Period, J. Period. Shazar, C-H-I-S-Z-A-R. I stand here tonight uh, as the former elected chairman of the 600,000 Democrats here in Dade County. I'm also a dues-paying member of several environmental organizations. Uh, most prominent here tonight, uh, for tonight's purposes, will be the Miami Pine Rocklands Coalition. Tonight's a historical night. It's a wonderful night to be a part of saving something that we once thought was gone. How rare an opportunity for the service and for this community and for this country to save something that we thought was once gone. The Pine Rocklands, particularly the Miami Richmond Pine Rocklands, is a globally imperiled habitat. It's not just rare, 
It's not just critical. It's globally imperiled in the sense that it exists almost nowhere else in the world, and it's almost gone. The pressures we have in this community to develop has destroyed the habitat of the Miami tiger beetle. It's done such in a way that we thought it was gone. Because we've saved a few parcels out of the original amount from the, rich, from the Richmond, uh, the Pine Rock Ridge quarter. It went from Ogis and Northeast Dade all the way down to the Everglades. Because we've saved a few parcels, it's come back. But let's not rest on our laurels. Let's designate it. Let's list it as endangered. And hopefully provide the inspiration for future generations here in Dade County to save this globally imperiled habitat. It has many, many, many species that call it home, whether it's the bonneted bat, bald eagles, the tortoises, the butterflies, or the Miami tiger beetle. I respectfully submit that if we restore pine rocklands, not that we knock down any homes and put back trees, but if we res restore the degraded areas, we will expand the range, expand the habitat. When was the last time we talked about expanding the amount of pine rocklands? There'll be people who will say because of nature or the lack of a lightning strike and a natural burn or a state-controlled burn that some of these areas are just ruined, that, that they're ruined forever. Well, that's not true, ladies and gentlemen. At the Tropical Audubon Society's privately held Porter Russell Pine Rockland Preserve, the entire 10-acre parcel has been brought back to life by hand with no fire serving not just a mitigation risk to the neighboring community of Goulds, but restoring the health of the forest. We can do that on the Richmond track. It's a lifeboat critical area. If you lose the glades for whatever reason, and you lose the coastal pine rocklands for whatever reason, the Richmond track becomes a lifeboat track. It becomes the most important single largest area of pine rocklands in the world. Not a single drop of concrete needs to go in that tract. Not a single drop. Every single thing that is done to destroy the Richmond tract constitutes a destruction of critical habitat. That's factor alpha. Factor echo, natural and man-made problems to destroy the habitat. We have seen through factor delta inadequate local regulatory mechanisms. The pressure, the natural man-made pressure, not just the neglect, but it's created a scenario where we don't even have healthy pine rocklands. We talk about how we haven't surveyed every inch that's on these maps back here. Well, a lot of it you're gonna find is unhealthy. At the end of the day, you have a unique opportunity, something that future generations will remember tonight for. Because I was lucky enough to be a part of saving the critical Pine Rocklands, you have an opportunity to designate the Miami Tiger Beetle as endangered and hopefully inspiring and serving as a catalyst to save the entire Pine Rocklands in South Dade. I want to thank the service for having us tonight. I want to thank Miami-Dade College for ha having us tonight. And please, please, just remember for future generations, you are the catalyst. Saving the tiger beetle can be the catalyst for saving the entire globally imperiled habitat of Miami Pine Rocklands. Thank you so much. May God bless Dade County and all who call her home. Thank you, Mr. Chizar. Now we'll have um, Ms. Ferreira. Hello, my name is uh, Carmen Ferreira. That's C-A-R-M-E-N, last name F-E-R-R-E-I-R-O. I don't represent any organization here. I'm here on my own. I'm an avid naturalist who explores Pine Rocklands quite frequently. And, and, you know, was fortunate to grow up near the Richmond track and got to enjoy that for many years of my youth. Um, one of my biggest concerns, and I want to thank the agency for giving us this opportunity to protect this species because it is so rare. And you can go to many different pine rocklands and not, you know, 
find species like this and find other species that are also threatened that this agency has given protection to. So thank you for your efforts and thank you for doing this and giving us the time to talk. I think it's appropriate that we're here in Miami-Dade College because you can step outside these walls and see fragmentation of pine rocklands. And the concern with the fragmentation of the critical habitat for the Miami tiger beetle really determines its survivability. You cannot have a species and, and have all this fragmented ecosystem and expect its long-term survival to be positive. That, that's just not going to happen. So I think it's really important that um, besides the surveys that were done in 2013, which Dr. Nisley had discussed, um, you know, that really a, a serious overall survey of the actual populations to ascertain their numbers is really key and, and important before this you know, incidental take permit uh, gets approved in the process that's now the HCP for uh, uh, Coral Reef Commons. It's, it's critical because you know, we, we, we know so little about this species. We thought it was gone. We know that it's, it's there, and, and we really owe it to it to really do our best you know, job to protect it. And, and, and that's what this uh, process is going to allow us to do. It's each, each key, you know, uh, you know as, as was mentioned in that wonderful presentation, you know, each, each species has a different need. And it's important to take a look at that individual species, as we do for others, and, and, and really you know, determine what is necessary to keep its future, uh, you know, its future lifespan uh, available. So I think that's important. That was one of my comments. Um, I think you know, also consideration to what's going to happen if development does go into that pine rockland. How are they going to maintain it when, you know, they're going to need necessary factors like fire maintenance to, to maintain a healthy pine rockland? Is that really feasible, uh, you know, and it's necessary for this species? Is that really feasible if you're going to put, you know, development in there? So all of these, you know, things are important to consider in considering how we're going to protect this, this particular species. And a lot of folks may think, well, it's just a tiny little insect. But it's important. It's important that we fight for this species. Um, so basically, you know, th those are my comments. Uh, from a passionate point of view, it's, it's sad to see that we've lost so much. You know, there, we talk about deforestation in Haiti, but, you know, that's kind of happened in South Data at an alarming rate since Hurricane Andrew. And, you know, do we really, do we really not want to fight for this species and give it a home that it can really survive in? and you know, expand uh, its, its numbers. So um, that's all I want to say, and thank you again for giving us this opportunity. Um, thank you, Ms. Ferrero. Next, we'll have Mr. James Duncan, followed by Belen um, Valedis. You, yes. You pass? Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. So um, I guess um, the next person will then be Mr. Paul Lambert. A no, no, no. After you. Oh. Yes. Oh. Yes, you're up. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Belen Valladares, and I'm the vice president of the Miami Pine Rocklands Coalition. Can you spell your name for our reporter? Oh. Spell my name? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, first name Maria, uh, M A R I A. Uh, middle name Belen, B E L E N. And last name Valladares, V A L L A D A R E S. I'm the vice president of the Miami Pine Rocklands Coalition, and I thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I became very concerned with. with the Miami Tiger Beetle, as I was writing a book for the uh, Miami Pine Rocklands Coalition about the critters that live in the area, and I became aware um, that there were only 100 individuals left, or approximately 100 individuals left, and I thought that it was um, just a, not acceptable that we go to uh, faraway places to uh, work with uh, species that are disappearing throughout the world. You know, we, Americans then help to um, help uh, uh, with elephants and with other species. Yet, in uh, right in the middle of Miami, we have the Miami tiger beetle that bears our, our city's name, and we have a hundred individuals left. And I actually believe that uh, every single square inch of habitat needs to be preserved. I don't think it's 
I don't think any of us doubt the fact that uh, climate change has also uh, had an impact on its habitat. And we, have, we will be hearing um, through many of the experts that we have here, all the different studies that we have that document the loss of habitat and how it impacts the species. And you know, I also thought that the Miami tiger beetle has a very, a very cool name, Miami tiger beetle. I mean, it's a tiny little critter, but you know what? So is a mouse, and we have Mickey Mouse. And I thought it would be good <laughs> that every kid in town wears a, a Miami tiger, tiger beetle t-shirt, and it could be used as a souvenir, and we could use it instead of trying to destroy the little habitat that it has left, we could uh, actually promote it as a symbol of our city and its uh, survival, you know. And well, thank you very much for letting me speak. And um, I really hope that uh, you take into consideration um, the fact that we really do not want to uh, diminish its habitat. Not, not one square inch should be um, taken away from the Miami tiger beetle. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lambert. And following Mr. Lambert, we'll have Mr. Chris Worth. Hi, good evening. My name is Paul Lambert. I'm here on behalf of Miami Wilds, um, L-A-M-B-E-R-T. Uh, I just want to make two comments, and if we have other comments, we will be making them electronically uh, through, through, the, uh, through the system. Uh, first of all, just a, a, a point of clarification. Miami Wilds has provided the service with plans that show the boundaries, the limits of the Miami Wilds development. Um, so to the extent that there's no formal plans that have been submitted, that's, that's accurate. Um, but certainly the limits of development have been shown to the service. Um, and so it's, it's just to clarify that point that, we're, that was brought up twice. Um, my, second, my second area of, thank you. My second area of clarification or uh, uh, comment has to do with the, uh, the critical habitat rule. Uh, when the service published the, uh, the proposed rule for the uh, Bertram uh, streak, hair, hair streak butterfly uh, back in 2013, um, both the habitat and the microhabitat were very clearly delineated from a geographic perspective within, within that rule. Um, that is not the case uh, with this proposed rule uh, for, the, for the beetle. And we just want to ensure that there is an opportunity to be able to comment uh, going forward on what that delineation of that boundary is prior to the form finalization of, of any rule. Um, and in fact, that becomes part of, the, part of the final rule process. And it was clarified a little bit tonight that, that, will, uh, that that's going to go forward. Uh, but that was, that was our only other comment for this evening. Um, otherwise, uh, we, we uh, also expect that, that the tiger beetle will, will be listed. Uh, we've done quite a bit of research around it. Um, and so uh, we're, uh, we're here to, uh, to listen and, and learn more about the tiger beetle and the process through which it's going to be listed and the protection of that beetle. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, we'll next have Mr. Worth and followed by Mr. or Ms. Cully. Okay, thank you. Good evening. My name is Christopher Worth, and that's W I R T H. I am here. Um, I'm not representing anyone. I do blog about tiger beetles online. Um, and have done some uh, significant work with the Miami Tiger Beetle for my undergraduate education. Uh, I'm here tonight to present some information, um, some analysis of historic aerial imagery concerning the habitat of this beetle. Uh, chiefly, this dates back to 1938, looking at the Richmond Heights Pine Rocklands tract. It is, um, the primary habitat type is Pine Rockland with some riverbed uh, looks like dry riverbed characters running through. The rocklands appear elevated. Moving on into 1944, there is a blimp base built on that site. The key uh, points to take away, during the construction of this, there is not only large runways laid down, concrete runways, um, asphalt surfaces as well, but some of the rocklands are scraped to the limestone. That is, every or organic characteristic is removed, trees, understory, that is all developed. 
And I'd like to point out that this area, um, scraped clean in 1944, was home to some of the best pine rocklands that we have today, thanks to management by Zoo Miami. And that was actually the site where the Miami tiger beetle was rediscovered in 2007. So this habitat can be highly modified, but through careful management, it can be restored. And we've seen that in several cases. The, the chief one is this clearing, scraping to the ground. And this is referenced in the Federal Register, um, the proposed ruling. Um, development concerning the second location of the Miami tiger beetle. I'd just like to comment that that area has been continually shrinking. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Has been continually shrinking since about 1963. There's been development impinging from the top, bottom, uh, originally. And now it is entirely fenced in. So this, this has been, even within the last 30 years, has undergone um, a shrinking in about, sh um, shrunk to a third of its current size. So I would strongly caution that the population at this second site should be surveyed um, as soon as feasibly possible because it may represent last traces, just from my analysis of the habitat history. A second point I'd like to bring up on the quality of habitat that's been previously cleared. Uh, the Miami tiger beetle has also been found at a site on the Sea Stars campus. Uh, I believe that's another Miami, University of Miami property. Um, that area was cleared in 1963. I can't attest to whether it was scraped to the limestone, like the areas along the runway, um, the blimp mooring pads of Richmond Naval Air Station. But I can say that there are no pine, um, pine trees visible in these aerial imageries. And that is for the majority of that Sea Star site. In the time since it's been cleared, it has regrown into um, a highly suitable habitat for the beetle. However, it has now surpassed that suitability and is continuing on in succession. There is significant vegetation accumulation, and I believe the service is already aware of this. But I'd like to. Um, add that the beetle is not only found on previously scraped areas, but previously deforested areas. So there is a high degree of recovery and retention of this habitat. Um, second few comments I'd like to make here are some concerns about climate change, increased rainfall. Um, it was mentioned uh, briefly about the tiger beetle life cycle. They spend significant portions of their life in subterranean burrows. And I'd just like to note there's a few studies showing that both um, tiger beetles can survive uh, flooded in, in a flooded, uh, saturated soil for periods of time. But that is contingent on the period of time and the temperature. And with colder temperatures, survival is longer. However, I'd like to raise concerns that um, with climate change, we may see increased temperatures and lower survivability um, with the impending uh, potential increase in rainfall. Uh, my comments will also be submitted in a written form with full citations uh, to the service at a later date. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Ward. Um, after Mr. Cully, we'll have James Tease. My name, is, <clears throat> me. My name is Cully Wagoner. That's C-U-L-L-Y, W-A-G-G-O-N-E-R. Second generation Miamian, uh, born and raised. Went to college right here, as a matter of fact. Uh, my concern is the same concerns that have been presented in, in the, tonight's uh, presentation is development or overdevelopment. The Richmond Pine Rocklands is the single largest tract of, of Pine Rocklands outside of Everglades National Park. And a great big piece of land becomes very tempting to developers and multi-billion dollar corporations like Sony and Walmart that want to put their properties on, their, on this piece of land. In the case of Coral Reef Commons, they submitted a 500 plus page ACP to you guys. I've read it and uh, they systematically eliminated a lot of creatures that might actually be on that property. I say this from experience because I'm a part of the train crew of the Gold Coast Railroad Museum, which is also on that property. 
I can tell you firsthand, I've seen endangered species like the rimrock crown snake. I've seen beetles on the property. I've seen the bonneted bats on the property. And they don't know property lines. So they go through the fences across the Department of Defense uh, location that's there, into the RAM property, onto the UM property, onto the zoo property. There is over a dozen endangered species live on that property. That, the entire 2,107 acres that the Navy bought in, 2000, in 1942 need to be considered uh, and protected. And everything that lives on them, including the tiger beetle, needs to be preser preserved and protected. And we depend on the fish and wildlife people to do that. So I would encourage you to do whatever you need. Okay, we're now on the record again, and we have one final commenter, Mr. Robin Luker. My name is Robin Luker, R-O-B-I-N, last name L-U-K-E-R. <clears throat> I'm here to represent my grandson, Chandler Jameson Smith. His mother and his uncle have camped on this piece of property. They've hiked all through the property with me. It would be a shame for this young man who has a book on insects that he learned his ABCs with, who you can find down on his hands and knees talking to little critters. It would be just shameful and a crime for the only time he could see wildlife is when he's driving down the expressway 60 miles an hour looking for it a mile or more. And it, it's just criminal that we don't have as much area as when I was a kid. I grew up, there's not, my grandfather was going, there's not as much wildlife as when I was a kid. I didn't have a father to take me out, but my grandfather did, and I did it with a scouting program. I took my children out. My grand, grandson has been out in the woods looking at feeling leaves and different things. I'd love for him to see the tiger beetle. But if we keep going the way we are, he's not going to see much of anything, like I didn't see as much as my grandfather did. You know, that's enough. We got to get off the bucket and start doing things about protecting what's around us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have no additional speakers. However, we'll leave the hearing open until 8 p.m. So at this time, we'll take a recess until and if. Go ahead. Um, we did have a couple of things that came up during your comments that we thought we'd go ahead and address real quickly. Um, with the question regarding de uh, critical habitat designation, that will be a public process similar to this one. It will be noticed in the Federal Register, so there will be opportunities for people to provide comments before there is a final designation similar to the process for this listing. So we wanted to make sure that that process was clear for folks. Um, the second thing was, and I've lost my notes, sorry. That, oh, with, with regards to cooperation with the state, we do cooperate with the state lockstep. We try very hard to make sure that they're involved in our processes and they, they ask for our involvement with theirs. So um, we will coordinate those efforts, but they are indeed separate and parallel processes. So just, do, just know that, that we, do, we do work closely with our colleagues at the state agencies. Was there a third one? Was that it? Okay. We thought that was it. If there was something else that we needed to clarify, did anybody? No. Okay. We just wanted to answer those questions before you left. Okay. Okay. So the hearing's over, but we will hang around until 9 p.m. 
um, give people a chance to speak with the representatives from the Fish and Wildlife Service and just sort of congregate with one another. Um, so at this time, um, we are now officially off the record. We thank you very much for your time and your comments.